Welcome to a series of podcasts from the Irish Linen Centre and Lisburn Museum. In these podcasts, we talk to historians, journalists, authors and community practitioners and invite them to share their research, their love of museums and their thoughts on the role museums play in society. This podcast has been made possible with the generous support from Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council. Hello and we're back with the next edition of the Winter Talk series the museum and joining me today is Dr Laura Patrick. Laura you're very welcome to the Lisburn Museum. Thank you very much, lovely to be here. Laura could you begin by telling us about your academic background and how you became involved in the work that you do? Absolutely. So my academic background is actually archaeology, which is a little bit at odds with working in a regimental museum. But started off way back, seems like a long time ago now, in 2010, and did my um, master's in professional archaeology up at Queen's University. But always had this love of museums and the stories that they can tell with the artefacts that we dig out of the ground. So while I was applying for my PhD 2014-2015, I started volunteering in Cart Fergus Museum and just fell in love with it, fell in love with what a museum does and the potential it has to tell the stories about our shared heritage and use that to illuminate, let's not say educate, but illuminate people as to the past that they maybe aren't aware of. And over time started doing much more contract work. During my PhD I still kept on the volunteering and did a lot of education and outreach um, with my boss there, Sharin, who was a really fantastic mentor and taught me all I know. (laughs) And then the opportunity arose to apply for this post, which was to set up a brand new museum for the regimental collections in Northern Ireland. And that that comes along once in a lifetime, I think, to to establish a new museum. So I jumped at the chance and and got it, thankfully. (laughs) This this type of museum, it's new. Yeah. In the time that you've been there, have you noticed a growth in interest in it? I think... My awareness has probably grown, so I've been there nearly two years, and it's not necessarily a type of museum that I would have been familiar before. Cart Fergus was much more archaeology and civic. This is very specific, being the regimental histories. And I think the more I talk to people about this post, the more I realise there's a wider interest out there than I initially thought. We did some research um, for our marketing and branding piece, and actually, whilst a lot of audiences don't necessarily visit the museums at the minute they're curious I think the decade of centenaries Mm -hmm. you've discovered oh my granda was at war and didn't tell us about it didn't speak about it we found the blocks in the attic and I think that has started to open up that kind of military history and as you say it's very specific to the regiments I suppose they all have their challenges but particularly in divided societies. What challenges do you think regimental museums or or museums that deal with our past have? I think they present a completely unique challenge here to the likes of examples in Scotland or England because of our more recent past. But I think if it's done properly, that there's avenues there where we can address those issues, open it up to community to debate and invite people in to have those discussions and to begin to understand different people's experiences and lived experiences and the effect that that has had. And it's only through having those conversations, you know, putting a veteran and a school child in the same room and letting them talk and let that happen organically, not forcing it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of potential there to try to heal some of those divides. We can't do everything, but we can at least start, start those conversations. Besides displaying artefacts related to the regiments, what other types of programmes do you have across the sites? So across the sites currently we have our permanent exhibitions and temporary exhibitions. For example, in our Inner Skillings Museum we have the Harp and Crown, which looks at the disbanded Southern regiments. They were disbanded 1921-22, obviously with the, um, the formation of Northern Ireland. Um, which is lovely. We've got that on loan from the National Army Museum. And research is our other big programming outreach piece that we would do. So we offer research, family research, but it's more that military history and the lives um, around before they served and when they came back. We are restricted in some cases just because of data protection. Mm -hmm. Um, But we we do what we can. And volunteers are another big piece of our outreach providing people with an opportunity to work with a collection and learn new skills. Yeah, so with regards to genealogy and family history, have you discovered any, anything that grabbed your interest that you can actually tell us about? I think there's so there's so many things. I, I'm not personally involved in the, the family research, but I think it's just the little stories. For example, 
because this is very much a learning curve for me in terms of that military history. So McFadgen, who's a Victoria Cross winner, um, first day of the psalm, threw himself on a box of grenades that were about to explode and saved everybody around him, was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, which we have in our Ulster Rifles collection. We can bring that out for people to see. And we compare that to Quig's Victoria Cross, um, which he won for saving life. He was bringing people back off the battlefield. And they look quite different in texture and tone because one was polished and one wasn't, because one was worn mm. and one wasn't. So I think it's little little pieces like that. Um, and it just it's just amazing whenever people walk in and our curators can go, oh, yes, I know who you're talking about. Come on. And I get their, their records or I, we've got their medals and just that, that link, I think, mm-hmm. to their ancestors. Is I think those type of things personalise and, you know, humanise people, or humanise artefacts, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And I think it... Um, the military and the British Army can seem quite faceless, I think, to a lot of people, whereas if you put a person, then all of, it, all of a sudden it's, it's much more human. Yeah. So is there much scope for collaboration across the site? What does that look like on a you know, day-to-day basis? Yep, so we all work together. We're all part of a, a team. So we have our Royal Irish Fusiliers in Armagh, the Inniskilling Museum in Inniskilling, and the Royal Ulster Rifles in Belfast. And I work with the curators on each site to make sure they have what they need, but also that our programming is cross-promoted. Um, if we've got research queries, that very much works across the board, that somebody might have a piece of information that the other museum needs. And, yeah, just a really fabulous team to work yeah. with. So what role had, if, if any, had these museums in marking some of the events, the 100-year events that we've been living through for, it seems like... <laughs> seems like a hundred years as well, you know, but um, over the last decade. With COVID, there's been a bit, a bit of a stretch, obviously. Um, and then I wouldn't be familiar with all the programming because I have joined a bit later. But temporary exhibitions, um, social media, um, marking specific dates, um, doing some outreach and, and facilitation around that. Um, and obviously for us, kind of come like, finishes off with that disbandment of our mm-hmm. southern regiments um, we've got really good links with the associations in the south and they come up for our remembrance day in November past so yeah so the, the, that's something uh, I, I suppose I didn't consider you've got your sites in Northern Ireland yeah. but also uh, it's it's nice to hear that there's a relationship between museums in the south and the north is yeah. that is oh, absolutely I mean the likes of um, Collins Barracks and the Irish soldier display down there and we've had advice you know on how we move our museum forward so now we've got very good links in yeah. the south because it very much is an all-island story. Yeah that's true. I, th- I suppose there's the distance of a hundred years ago but we've touched upon it you know the more recent past and what we could call difficult histories. Yeah. Museums do have a role in these difficult histories. What, in your view, is the role of a museum? Not necessarily a regimental museum, but a public a public museum uh, in dealing and trying to navigate around these difficult histories? I think if, if a good museum can remain neutral, it provides that safe space for these difficult conversations to be had, um, for people from different communities with different perspectives to come together and have a discussion, not an argument because that doesn't solve anything um, and I think if people can then walk away you know, their opinions might not be changed but at least they've heard another perspective it might soften things and I think it's it's absolutely essential that we all try to engage with those difficult conversations because they're not going away and they keep you know they keep just turning over and turning over until I think we begin to start processing some of that shared and inherited trauma mm-hmm. from from our recent history um, and it is, it's about just in, inviting that conversation and debate and presenting the facts and then letting people talk about it and interpret it. Yeah, I think uh, museums do have this role and, and it's, a, it's a very important role. And sometimes it, it seems that the conversations are going on in museums rather than in political circles. Yeah, and I think as well it's important for us as, you know, air quotes professionals to remember that we don't have all the knowledge mm. So it's really important to bring the communities in and hear what knowledge that they have as well and how they can add to the story and how they then see themselves within that museum space. Yeah. 
I ask this question of all our guests, and they're usually historians, so they're not directly involved in museum work. You are involved in museum work, and you've, you know, so you're in a bit of a unique position here. Out of everything that you've, even back in Carrick Fergus, in your role presently, is there one item that you would take that you really like that you would place in the museum here in Lisbon? Oh gosh, that is a very difficult question. Okay, pick two. Uh, there is, well, the archaeologist in me loves the barbariate that's all on display in Craig Fergus Museum. It belonged to the monks at the local friary. Um, and just the fact that that appears in Craig Fergus <laughs> yeah, just so odd. Um, and one that the kids love. And then I think Quig's Victoria Cross, because it's that, the pride that he had wearing that because he saved a life and that's what Victoria Crosses were given for, it was for saving life. So the two extremes of my <laughs> of my interest, yeah. yeah. Laura, thanks very much for taking the time to speak with me today thank and I'm very much, much looking forward to your talk later on this evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thanks.